<laughs> Here we are. Here we are. Hey, y'all. Welcome to New Orleans Poetry Fest 2021. This is our sixth Poetry Fest. Um, if we count the pandemic year as a non-festival year. <laughs> uh, so this year we are completely virtual. All events are free and we decided why not do an event every single day of April for Poetry Month because why not? We want to immerse ourselves in poetry. So that's what we're doing. You can access all of our rooms from nolapoetry.com. Uh, we're also live on Facebook on our Facebook page. So hopefully you can easily access all these events. Tonight our opening event is live, semi-live. We have a hybrid event happening here. We'll have some live readings and we'll also have some people zooming in. Um, and we are so happy to be in Cafe Istanbul because this is where we have done our opening events for the last three years. Um, usually the room is packed with poets. Uh, so it's a little different. There's only a, a handful of people <laughs> in here tonight, um, but we'll try to keep it lively and exciting for you. And we're really excited to present this anthology that's called I Am New Orleans. Uh, it was put up at UNO Press last year, and we're gonna have some amazing poets come and read from that. This is my co-director, Bill Lavender. Hey. <laughs> and we just want to, uh, we want to say thank you to a couple of sponsors, uh, the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation, uh, gave us a generous grant uh, that allowed us to put a lot of this stuff on and the Academy of American Poets gave us another one. Um, and that's basically why everything's free this year. And so we, we really appreciate that. And um, I think without further ado, I'm gonna introduce the editor of the I Am New Orleans Anthology, Kalama Yasalam who was one of our featured readers, was that 19? 2019, the last 2019, time we were all together. 2019, the last live event, and uh, Kalama brought down the house. I mean, it was really unbelievable. And um, so we were, uh, we, that made us all the more excited when this anthology came out. Uh, Kalama is no stranger to editing anthologies. Um, I think, was your first one is gonna go in the river? No. First one was uh, Word Up. Word oh, okay. Up. That was um, Black Poetry from the Deep South. Okay. And then after Word Up, I think we did uh, 360 Degrees. Then we did uh, From a Bend in the River. Yeah. yeah. That one I was in, that's why I remember. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's, it's just been continuing to try and do something every four or five years. You know, put a yeah, book out. cool. And you did, the last one you did was the Tom Dent anthology, which was amazing. That was the last, yeah, last anthology. Yeah. New, New Orleans, yeah, yeah, yeah last anthology. So. Right. So, uh, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Kalamu, who's going to talk about this anthology, and um, and then he'll introduce the readers. And uh, we have a, a bunch of them coming up. Should read eight to ten minutes a piece. Um, and uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Kalamu. Okay. Thank you for coming. This is the book, I Am New Orleans. There's a little story that goes with the book. My name is Kalamu Yasalam, and uh, I'm, I have been writing since, professionally since I joined the Free Southern Theater in 1968. And we've been doing, as the saying goes, some of this and some of that for a long time. This, um, this collection in some ways is, is special and in other ways it's, it's another collection. Let me tell you about why it's special or why I think it's special. The title poem was written by Marcus Christian who was um, from up country in Louisiana, moved to New Orleans. And I was first introduced to Marcus Christian 
when I was in high school, I graduated in 64, but um, actually in junior high school, well before that, uh, around 59 or 60. And he had written a poem that was included in an anthology by Honor Bonton and Langston Hughes. And that was one of the major anthologies of uh, African-American literature. And his poem was on McDonald's Day. Uh, some of you probably don't remember that now, but you certainly know that we have this city and Baltimore are the two places that have schools which are dedicated to John McDonald because McDonald, who, who, uh, who was a businessman and slave trader, to be truthful about it, uh, when he died, he willed a ton of money to New Orleans and to Baltimore for education and specifically wanted to make sure that schools were built. So that's why we have so many McDonald's schools here in New Orleans. And if you go to Baltimore, you'll see the same. So um, going all the way back to that time period, development went on with the public schools. And in the public schools, we all used to, as high school, or well, as public school students, you'd go down to the main library, Tulane and Loyola, on, on that day, and you'd stand there in the sun. And if you were black, you had to wait until the white students did their thing, but you'd lay a, a reef at uh, John McDonald's statue and have a program and what have you. It was a lot of fun, Jim Crow fun, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's what that's what happened, and it brought it up to the current time. So I'm in the, about so, I want to say 59, 60. I'm reading this anthology on a bonton, and in it there's a poem by Marcus Christian on, and the poem is about McDonald's Day. And, and was, he was saying how dear it was, and he was using that in a very specific sense, how dear it was, how much it cost people um, to celebrate John McDonald, if you were a student and what have you. Marcus Christian went on to do amazing research. He has a um, among people who study his work, he has an amazing, what can I call it? I can call it a travelogue, I can call it a map, I can call it uh, an essay, but it's about how the street names got their name, how the streets got their name in New Orleans. And he goes, he did a lot of research on, on that. So for the 250th anniversary of the city of New Orleans, Marcus Christian was commissioned to write a commemorative poem about New Orleans. He called the poem, I Am New Orleans. It is epic as far as I'm concerned. It's a, it's a major work. And in the, um, after Katrina hit in 05, 2005, I was teaching school along with uh, Jim Randalls. We had a program called Students at the Center. And we taught school down the street here at Douglas, at McDonald 35, and at McMain. And we um, taught Marcus Christian's poem I am New Orleans, which basically, um, I think all poets who claim to be New Orleans poets, you should read that poem. And the way you can read it is in the book. Yeah, right. yeah. All right, that's enough of that. Um, <laughs> he's, a, 
his poem is the lead poem. And so that's why this book, this anthology is called I Am New Orleans. His poem is the lead poem in the anthology and you can read it and understand it because it is basically a summary of how New Orleans became New Orleans. And Marcus Christian wrote about all of the, for lack of a better term, all of the ethnic groups that make up New Orleans, how they came here and so forth and so on. It's, um, it's worthy of study, one as a, as a poet, two as a student, but three as an intelligent person who knows how to read. Now, I'm sure you fall into one of those categories. Poet, student, or intelligent poet who knows how to read, or intelligent person, excuse me, who knows how to read. Do we have any intelligent people in the house? Yeah. Okay. You know how to read. Yeah. Oh, okay. So then you can read I Am New Orleans by Marcus Christian. I woke up one morning. Um, let's see, we're at 2001 now. This was in 2019. I woke up one morning and uh, I have a thick head, you know. I have problems with school and stuff like that. So as many people, like when you say in New Orleans, what school you went to? Nobody answers what college they went to. What do you do? You answer what? High school. What high school you went to. That's cause once we graduate from high school, we got other things to do. <laughs> <laughs> Here in New Orleans. Um, at the same time, New Orleans has 11 colleges and universities, 11 colleges and universities in this, this town of ours, New Orleans. So I woke up one morning and there it was knocking on my thick skull. You need to do something because I, I've already had a history of doing anthologies. We did something called uh, Word Up, Black Poets in the Deep South. We did a, a number of them. One of the ones we did was from a bend in the river. And um, that, there's a historic sto a story about that. We, we got our little money together, saved our nickels, dimes, turned them into dollars and so forth. And we uh, decided we're going to do our first hardback book. We did that book. Um, and John Scott, the MacArthur fellow who was uh, also um, the, one of the leading artists, some of his public artwork is around. You can see it around the city. Um, he allowed us to store our inventory of books in his studio, which he had out, um, out past Gentilly on Almanaster, out, out that way. And of course, when Katrina came, Katrina said, New Orleans needs to be cleaned up. And how do you clean things? You wash them down, right? What happened to our city? It got washed down. And Katrina didn't actually do it because Katrina hit hardest Mississippi and Alabama. What happened here was the levees broke. That's what really happened here. So although we say Katrina, what we really mean is that the levees broke. When the levees broke, the city was flooded. We lost all of the books when the city flooded. It was um, on the one hand devastating and on the other hand, it created within us an attitude. Well, I guess we got to start over and do this. We got to do, we have to do it. And most of the people who 
uh, how many of y'all were, were New Orleanians before Katrina? All right, most of us who are New Orleanians before Katrina, if we're still here, we of the mind, we got to do it. We have to do it. We have to make something so that our city survives. And I had seen it before with Betsy in 68. But in 2005, Katrina, in, when Betsy came, it was actually the hard part of the flood was below the industrial canal. But when Katrina, hence the, when the levees broke, it was a, almost all of the city, the city proper. I live on the West Bank. It didn't affect the West Bank in terms of flood water, but we decided to keep going. I know this is a long introduction, but I'm doing this because poets need to know from whence they came. You didn't just pop up. You might have individually popped up and say, I'm gonna do something, aren't you? I'm gonna do something. And you know, your sister was on the sidewalks, Mary Mac, 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 all dressed in black, 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 all of that kind of stuff. Well, that's all poetry, right? And that's deep in New Orleans. But you need to know the history so in order for you to proudly call yourself a poet, you got to do more just than just, you know, scribble four or five poems down and be bothering Chuck and, and Bill <laughs> Lavender and say, can you print my shit? <laughs> it, don't, it don't work that way, poet. Well, I mean, Bill might give you a little bit of play. <laughs> <but> <laughs> But in general, you have to do some work and you have to have some understanding about what you're doing. So we get to, the, we get to where we are now, especially with this COVID stuff, we get to where we are now. And I woke up with the idea of saying, yeah, I am New Orleans. We're gonna honor our ancestor Marcus Christian and uh, We'll put his poem first in the, in the anthology. And I say, well, I did from a bend in the river, which was 100 New Orleans. Did you all know they had over 100 New Orleans poets? In yeah, 100 poets was in, you know, were included in uh, from a bend in the river. And this little book here is not as big, but it's all right. And it's got some <laughs> It's got this, this amazing picture of Marcus Christian when he was an adolescent, teenager, going, and going into adulthood on the country. See that, Chuck? When you grow up, you can be like that. <laughs> so, um, so we put this together. And we got some of the people that's in this amazing collection. They're standing by. And they they ready to rumble, they ready to do they do and so forth. And since Chuck is sitting there, I know he wants to take a moment so he can finish his beer. Or is that Scotch you're drinking, man? Oh, I got a Oh, okay, yeah, it's Amber. It's it's a beer. He's trying to be nice. It, well, it's not nine o'clock yet, huh? <laughs> <laughs> After nine, all bets are off. Chuck Lavel, but never mind. I won't even go into that. <laughs> I'll leave that alone. Don't tell them, don't tell them. <laughs> you got a payment not to tell them that. <laughs> See, all the places you got to pay people to say something. In New Orleans, you got to pay people to shut up. <laughs> so let's 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 start. I believe Christina K. Robinson yes. is with us. Is she with us? She is with us. She is. With us. She is Christina coming coming up out of, of Seventh Ward, I believe, and um, you know we're gonna take y'all all around the city. So right now we're gonna hear from Christina K. Robinson and her selection from "I Am New Orleans." Okay, can y'all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, baby. Okay. 
Um, so yeah, I'll start with the poem that is in the book, right? And I am supposed to read other poems, right? I'm checking in, making sure. Well, you can read, do what you want to. No, I'm just making sure that I'm supposed to read more than one. Well, yeah, you can read, uh, you can read one and a half. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm just saying, I'm just trying to understand. That's all. Okay, all right. Let me get to the page. You ain't got time to write nothing now. Come on, just read. I'm finding the page. I gotta find the page, you know. Even though it's a short poem, I should have it memorized. But um, this is uh, Indian Red. Oh, yeah. So, Indian Red, my lover, my friend, my adversary, I miss you on Sunday. I look for you amongst the feathers behind the mask, search this crowd for your face. I said that I would not come out this year, that I have nothing to celebrate, too many things to mourn. Yet and still, the downbeat lulls me here. New Orleans is a sea of ghosts. Everywhere are reminders of those things beautiful and lost forever. Both beautiful and lost forever. You gonna read another one, come on. I okay. take back my half and give you a whole. <laughs> All right, so this is really short too. Um, it's called Identity Card. Uh -huh. And it's a homage to Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish. Um, so identity card. All you can hope is that one day they will at least at last eat your words. To sling rocks is tiresome. I want to start a fire. Yeah. yeah. So why don't you tie ties with one more, baby? Okay, <laughs> last one. Um, so this one, it's about, or it refers to the, uh, the Congo uh, cosmology. So all of the people that are from like Basair, Congo Brazzaville, Gabon, North Angola, they all use, or a lot of people use this kind of cross uh, cosmogram at the top. Yeah is the apex of life at the bottom is the ancestral realm and in the middle there's a line that goes through which is water um, and traditionally that water has been associated with the atlantic ocean um, and crossing the atlantic is going from the land of the living to the land of the dead and the only way to come back is to recross it um, and so that line in the middle is called the Kalunga line. And so this poem is called Kalunga. Kalunga. Cross and uncross, draw lines, day and night, sun and moon, girl, sanguine and true, resident of the deep, sent across space to straddle, wander ahead and behind in time. Hey girl, do you see? Where you going? Where you been? Say water, say blood. I'm your girl, sanguine and true. Say trust me and she'll always be good to you. Sanguine and true, born in the evening, liquid fire to the rising and setting. To those who have captured me here, fear and fear not. If I truly wanted to end your world quicker than you can blink, I would all quiet my mind and watch you think. That's it. Christina K. Robinson, y'all. <laughs> Christina, we want to thank you for kicking us off um, so lyrically. Um, if I was, if I didn't have no manners and, and no morals, you gotta have both manners and morals. But if I didn't have no manners and no morals, I'd say read to me all night, baby. That's they're your voice. <laughs> but I got some manners and morals and plus the security man, Chuck over there looking at me, cross-eyed, saying, that's my woman. What you doing talking like that? <laughs> Thank you, Christina.
We're going to go now to, uh, let's see. I got a, they gave me a list, but I can't read. So, uh, Akila Tony, is, uh, is Akila? She's in, She's in the house, all right. Akila Tony coming up out of ninth floor. Come on, Akila. Hey, everybody, how y'all doing? So the poem I have for you today, um, it's called Minstrel Jukebox. Hold on, let me stop right there. You got to have at least two poems. Yeah, <laughs> one to get in and one to get out. I got you, I got you. All right, poems come on now. With the S on the end. Uh, my name is Akila Tony. Again, I'm a poet and artist. And the first poem I have for you, um, details about the minstrelsy of being from New Orleans. A lot of times we talk about, you know, the beautiful things and the positive things, but this poem, um, it was resting on my heart to talk about um, what's the downside or what's, what's, a, what's loss. Minstrel Jubilee, 2020. The New Orleans Negro. I have been commodified, sold in the French Quarter, next to voodoo dolls and lime hand grenades. My body forces a rotting smile and I second line, and I second line, and I second line to blister bubbles form on the heels of my feet. My hips swing in a stiff humidity. My smile makes sharp cups in my brown cheeks and colorful beads harness my neck like an iridescent noose. My pain arouses the white onlookers. They clap with such joy and praise, but I know their eyes say dance, nigga dance, and I dance while time slows to mock me, only speeding when I rest my body from the minstrelsy. Yes, indeed. Thank y'all in that poem. Um, Kind of, you know, I didn't mean to start off on that note, but it is a real thing of like this idea of mistressy and being from New Orleans and the, the, the performative and commodification of us is something that um, sits on my heart a lot. Um, and it's in uh, another poem I want to leave y'all with is also about giving thanks to my elders um, from New Orleans and my family and my ancestors, because, you know, like Baba was saying, you know, we got to honor those who came before us. Grandmother was a magician. I am the granddaughter to a grandmother who will be a grandmother to a granddaughter who will be a grandmother to a granddaughter, all coming from the same grandmother. And my grandmother was a magician. I know she didn't have a wand or a spell book or a black cauldron. She had her home. She had her kitchen where she became sorceress with salves, storing sauces with sausages, soothing neck and back, reminding you that slouching unwelcomes blessings. She said, sit up and be fulfilled. Give us a reason we worked in them fields, telling me to be like the curls on the back of my neck and rest, because after all, I'll still grow. Grandmother was a magician. Black coffee and butter bread with sisters on Sundays. She was brown with river water hands that kissed on black and soil. She was plump figs and tattling bay leaves on the corner, tickling roots and tickling her grandbaby's bellies with colored pickings from her garden. And the sun knew not to shine above her hat because it knew not to play in her face. Grandmother was a magician. She was leather Bible and bay leaf, humming in hymn, soil hands and satin gloves, beacon and belt, brown spirits and church wine, cook and conjurer, mother and father. She was, she be, she is, she share. My grandmother was a magician. Grandma magic, legs crossed somewhere in the air, telling the North Star to wave to her children. Grandmother was a magician. She is. And Akilah Tony. <laughs> so we know where you got your magic from. You come by it honestly. 
and we appreciate you honoring your ancestors. And we want to just encourage you to keep on keeping on because you're doing a good job. Now let us see um, who else is in the house. Is, is Scribe called Quest here? Yes, in the house. He's in the house. Quest now, here. Quest, I got to tell y'all this. Mm -hmm. Quest is one of them people <laughs> that was born up there in New York. And he came down here. I don't know if he was chasing a woman or what he, Chuck owed him some money or what, whatever. But he came down here and he got stuck. And then he got to loving it. And like they say in the ninth war, he started to liking it. You know, he liked being down here. And so he, he is more associated with New Orleans than he is from where he was born. But that's all right. Because down here in New Orleans, we used to, you know, receiving deviants from all over the world. <laughs> and treating them just like they, yeah, treat, treat them just like they're human beings. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so right now we're gonna hear from a scribe called Quest. What's going on, fam? Yeah, um, so much love, man. You know, uh, a lot of folk don't know I'm a, I'm a Brooklyn boy baptized in the bayou. You feel me? My, I'm eight generations deep uh, going back through my maternal line and even my paternal line, I come to find out. So, uh, man, since you just put it down for the grandmas and I almost feel like I got to bring some grandma energy up in here real quick. So um, I wasn't going to do this piece, but since we in that vibe, I think I'll do that piece. And then I will give y'all a little piece from the book and we can uh, you know, pass it on as we sit down here. All right, y'all, y'all bear with me. Uh, I ain't done this one from memory in a minute. I ain't done nothing in a, in a minute uh, poetry wise, but uh, this one is for, for the Igungun, my Fede Fonfon, highest reverence to uh, Gloria Green. There once was a woman from New Orleans who rose before the sun every morning, got out of her bed and onto her knees to whisper prayers to the heavens, she said, the names of each of her children and her children's children, asking God to shelter them and a little bit of heaven through the hell of this world used to boast of a 20 grandkids and how none of them ever found a prison cell or an early grave for a home used to thank the heavens and revel in the wonder that God had made my grandmother. It was all pride and praise and proverbs, all grace and gospel and glory with a little splash of diva, top of dignity, but still down home enough to return from church service and take off that leopard print tam and that tweed blazer hanging up next to that red siren of a hat she wore only on special Sundays throwing an apron and make holy sanctum of that kitchen with hands poised as if in prayer. She made righteous testimony of the stuffed bell pepper, baptized the shrimp in okra in a rule as rich as the history that she came from, seasoned the chicken like it was time for them things to come home to roost, prepared meals like she did people, like she was raising them up to be somebody, to have a story to tell to the taste buds so tons could testify and revel in the wonder that Gloria Green had made my grandmother. Was all Edgar, Louisiana Braveheart, y'all, marching up a dust and sweat road at the tender age of 14 to plant her feet in a big city and forge roots for her little sisters and brother never knowing that from that fertile ninth ward soil would sprout five daughters like southern trees that would branch out across a country bearing fruit to span the width of an entire planet my grandmother was seamstress at the textile factory what they mistook for a poor brown girl at the limits of some company's sewing machine was in fact a weaver of miracles flooding together the fabric of her children's tomorrows. My grandmother was alchemist of the dollar out of 15 cent. As only an eighth grade graduate in the neighborhood of nouveau black bourgeoisie could possibly know how. Was counting the money slowly, huh? Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. But I wish a so-and-so would try to fire me without giving me my retirement. Bitch, I take him and his whole corporation to court. My grandmother was eight and a half decades, two-time hurricane survivor, was a magnitude of matriarch too mammoth for my measly metaphors. I can no more her bottle her greatness in the words than I can lay hands on her spirit. Now whispering in the wind, these words are with the tracing of the silhouette left in her absence, these words 
of the sketching of the footprint she left on all our souls these words of the evidence of a thing not seen but felt it is said family that our ancestors they never die so long as their spirits live on in their names they blossom from our tongues grandmother gloria green who of our family tree your name is glorious green harvest your name is righteous blossom in the mouths of your five children 20 grandchildren 35 great grandchildren your name is to be reborn and exalted upon all our tongues again and again and again and again as you did us every morning in prayer before the sun rose All right, whoo, made it, damn, all right, I, I was stretched, I ain't done that in a minute. Um, so yeah, that's for uh, GMA, that's for Gloria Green and the spirit of all my ancestors, all made gong gong, um, especially from right here um, in Louisiana. Uh, we're gonna keep it Louisiana centric. I'm going to give y'all two short poems and I'm out. Um, next poem, I'm gonna read this straight off my Instagram stories, y'all. I'm gonna keep it all the way 100 with you. I could not find this on my labby toppy, but thank, thankful for uh, modern technology. I'm gonna give you a little computer, computer love translation of this piece. I wrote this um, about 363 weeks ago. I know, cause again, modern technology. It was in my stories at the beginning of this little quarantine we in, in the pandemic. And uh, I wrote it reflecting on, you know, um, the emptiness in New Orleans streets in the middle of it has no title. There are no metaphors to script these blank pages. The city is a gutted garfish, hollowed out crustacean, is the collapsed shell of a red crawfish gone gray, its life sucked out, swallowed by revelers long gone. The revelers, once living, breathing tropes now erased from the sapless city's parched pages, I go riding up the lines, tracing them like veins, stethoscope eyes, searching for signs of life. Boarded window after boarded window, a redaction on reverb. Right where the streets curve, the percussion of brass loud enough to fill the block with a mile of sound, all silence. All faded echoes of a pulse once beat the block, its blood flow once painted these pages, the color of our insides. All right, y'all, I'm gonna close out with this piece right here. Appreciate the, the echo love. This is so weird. <laughs> I usually be right there in Cafe Istanbul. Now it's feeling really futuristic, but we're gonna bring it on home with uh, comfort food. This is a uh, one of those beautiful poetry moments. Poets, y'all know about it. You be riding on your bike, you be sitting in traffic and something just drops out of the heavens into your dome. And this is how this one happened. It's that moment in New Orleans traffic when the stockpile cars form blood clots in the city streets, when the whole damn small town is a congested body, overrun with clogged arteries. When you become the self-loathing mouth of this unhealthy body, cursing every moment that led you to a moment so stifled, looking for meaning in this madness, for a metaphor like a doctor's diagnosis, or perhaps the otoscope to shed light on the situation. When you remember how much fun it is stuffing your face with more than you can handle in the first place, how much comfort you've always found in this town's food, no matter how bad the indigestion. Thank y'all, much love. We appreciate you. <laughs> a scribe called Quest. Is Kelly Harris DeBerry in the house? Yes, Kelly's in the house. Kelly, where you at? I know you're uptown, up there by River Bend. I can't hear you, you got to- Hey, I'm here. I, um... <laughs> Hey, Baba, greetings to everybody. Um, how are you all this evening? So good to be with you all. Um, and it's, it's an honor to be in this anthology um, with so many poets that I respect and love. Um, I'm going to do Post Katrina Blues and uh, another short one after that. 
ribbon cuttings can almost make you forget black bodies shot on Danziger Bridge, Henry Glover burned, skull still missing. A new city, a new year, makes neighborhoods look rebuilt. Zoom in closer, lift the headlines, Rent rose higher than the water lines, still coughing from Chinese drywall and FEMA trailers. Housing and home ain't the same thing. It ain't easy no more. It's millennials walking their dogs in their purses, transplants complaining about loud jazz and correcting Southern pronunciations. Super Bowls can make you forget the donations spent to attract people far, far away that want you to smile for their pictures. They selfie you without permission and want to pet your hair and order you like a cold drink and ask you to twerk for their research. All this new can make you forget how to talk like that and them and all the people we be before it was new. Better for whom families can afford to stay in their new old neighborhoods where they've always been. This new can make you forget the smell of sitting water and feces and the dead that never saw the new coming. A black president can make you forget Bush and trick eyes into believing we are post racial milestones can be mind games old ways still the same pre-k to post-k plantation education left every children under a blanket of greed tuck them into poison homeless beg and shake a saint's cup and yell we won who screams for the hungry and the bellhop serving a silver smile on a tarnished platter who eats and whose hands rock this city? Poe boys can make you forget the poor and who makes the bread, who slices us and hires our genius at minimum wage, got a dance to keep from crying, can't see my face in the new shiny buildings can't make new shiny buildings can make you forget slow love and porch talk and sweet tea and borrowed sugar and families who knew your grandmama and them katrina anniversaries can make you leave new orleans for detroit or the next new Maybe I'm new too. Gotta remember how to rescue myself cause all this new still leaves me waiting in a long, long line for help. Um, so my daughter is, um, doing virtual class and they're learning about New Orleans history. And so one of their assignments was to um, look up some second lines tutorials. And oh, she had a fit about that. She just thought, she thinks it is so ridiculous to have a second line tutorial. She said, either you know how to do it or you don't. Um, and so, <laughs> so uh, she did her assignment, but she wasn't happy about um, learning how to second line off a of video off of YouTube. So I'll do this one and end. Super Sunday, New Orleans. Black people, ordinary royalty, crown themselves in bold faced streets, tip their heads back 
into unpredictable skies, dance between bad days and bright feathers, gold teeth sweaty women squat low and nest on this unbreakable city, burdens laid down under the bridge on a porch on a rooftop is how you fly away for a moment, a lifetime. Trumpets and trombones point back at God. This is the sound of the people who came through bloody waters afloat on faith in ancient drums, dancing to remember how to unchain the body, return it to a sea long ago. Look at this Sunday, unspeakable joy, all the glory, all the footwork. Thank you. So Kelly, I, I, I'm gonna admonish you not to forget about that place they call Ohio where you come from, but we're glad to see you here. And we welcome you. And uh, seems like, well, I'll put it this way. Your husband from Mississippi, you from Ohio, but your daughter's from where? Yeah, I yeah you Oh, she didn't hear oh. me. Okay, they muted me. Um, yes, I know she's she's always trolling us about that, that she's from New Orleans. Um, <laughs> it's been 17 years that I've been here, so I hope that that makes me somewhat of uh, um, a home native or or someone that people see as a, a New Orleanian after Yeah, seven. you're a New Orleanian. <laughs> so thank yeah. you, thank you. Thank we you. appreciate Bob. you. Thank you, appreciate you too, love you. All right, uh, let's see, Jai Salam, is he in the house? Well, no, if he's not in the house, no, huh? Raise your hand if you're in the house. Put something in the chat if you're in the house. Okay. Sky is here. Sky is here. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. This is a young lady who's been around a long time and finally. <laughs> Let me stop. Let me stop being a fool. <laughs> Sky, where you at? You in Vermont right now? I'm in Vermont right now. <laughs> yeah, she, she, she go all over the place. It's true. I know her. She goes <laughs> all over the place. And everywhere she goes, she be talking about, y'all got some red beans? <laughs> <laughs> Sky Jackson, y'all. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you for that intro, Kalamu. Always calling me out. I love it, though. I need that in my life. Uh, I'm going to read. Um, I'm going to read my poem from the anthology. It's called Spoon Rest Mammy. Um, just a little context. Um, I was working in the French Quarter in New Orleans in a little tourist shop selling like chopped peas and horrible other things, you know. And so um, this, that situation or that circumstance inspired this poem. Wait, wait a minute, Sky, before you do that poem, you, I, I know you didn't realize, but this is a New Orleans joint. You got to have one to get in and one to get out. I'm going to read another one. Or do you want me to read something else first? No, 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 that's fine. I'm just letting you know that if you get in with one, you got to get out with another. Okay, I can do that. All right, go on <laughs> with it. Just go on with your bad self. All right. Spoon Rest Mammy. One. On Tuesday at work, my manager, a brown Latina married to a black man, approaches me. With a smile, she sets something down in front of me and asks, What do you think about these? I look down at a porcelain spoon rest shaped into the swollen figure of a mammy. Her lips exaggerated and face dark like the bark of a dead tree. The dress painted Jemima red with a white apron tied chain taut around her waist. 
my heart races in its cage. After a second, I say, we shouldn't sell these. They are offensive. My manager purses her lips, sighs and says, but they sell, my dear Sky. People buy them. Two, at the end of my shift, a Latina woman with frizzy bleached blonde hair stands in front of me. She says, I'm from California, just buying these for my kids as a joke. They're gonna be so mad, she says. They're gonna be so mad I bought these. She hands me two of the mammy spoon rests, says, make sure you wrap them up good. I'd hate for them to break on the flight back home. So I protect them in paper and bubble wrap, carefully place each one in a plastic bag. You know, the lady says, your store shouldn't carry these. I hand her the bag, smile and say, but they sell. Three. Three weeks later, my manager hands me a cardboard box. I open it to all the spoon rest mammies gathered together. They all smile up at me from the guts of the box. My manager says, I tried to donate them to Goodwill, but the guy accepting donations said, I won't sell these. But if you want, I can throw them in the dumpster out back. I'd be happy to do that. Thanks y'all. So in this next poem, I'm gonna take y'all from the French Quarter uptown. Um, this poem is called Far Too Kind. Hold on, let me get set up here. I walk into the dining room and sit down as candles light up a thicket of white faces that surround me. Across the table, a lady smiles at me and says, God, I loved your book. It was so real. She talks as everyone else meddles with their slick Mandarin salads and listens. My mind is still outside uptown on Peniston and circles the block in search of a place to park. I flip my thick twists out of my eyes, check my teeth for lipstick in the rear view mirror. I find a spot as a white woman draped in the shadow of a dark mansion across the street has stopped to watch me. Her platinum hair shines white as sin under the street lights. Her gaze sharp like an elegant heel pinned into the nape of my neck. I lock the car door, turn to her and smile hello but she doesn't respond, just stares. As I walk up to the house, fumble with the fence latch, still aware of that stare that followed me to the dining room table, that passed me the cocoa vent, that poured another rush of bourbon into my glass, that crushed me with polite conversation. My hands shake slightly as I finally respond. Thank you so much for reading. You are far too kind. You are far too kind. Thank you, everyone. And Scott, Scott, before you before you get out of here, I've been meaning to ask you, uh, you know, on a QT. I was gonna keep it on the download, but uh. How you got your name? How'd I get my name? Yeah, oh, Sky. S K Y E. <laughs> Do it again. S K Y E. <laughs> um, you know, my mom, you know, she had she always wished for a daughter. 
And so when she was pregnant with me, she would look up at the sky and she would just say, God, if you give me a daughter, I will name her Sky because the sky is the most beautiful thing that I know, you know? And so here I am and I became, I became Sky, I guess. <laughs> So right now, Sky, thank you very much. <laughs> and the skies have opened us up. And right now, we in this establishment, and just like you find all over New Orleans, the owner is going to be behind the bar. <laughs> oh, Jahi's here? Yeah, we have it. All right. Well, Chuck, you can. You can right yeah, he, he can take, you can take another drink. We'll be with you in a minute. <laughs> Uh, Jai, that's my grandson, y'all. Yeah, you're right. So Jai, okay, okay, it's on mute. I'm, I'm sorry, it just had to be me. I'm like, damn, it's always. <laughs> I'm on Samika phone. That's why I had her name. It didn't have Jai, so they ain't see. Uh huh, uh huh. Yeah. Oh, come on, boss. <laughs> All right. Um, this, this the piece from the book. Okay. Y'all can hear me, huh? We can hear you. Okay. We can hear you good. Turn it 90 oh, okay. degrees. Oh, oh, I got you. I got you. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> All right. This is a dedication to the native population. This is a wake up call to the brainwashed and miseducated. This is a wake up call to the oppressed and manipulated, to the divided and conquered, separated and infiltrated. This ain't what MLK was dreaming about when he fought for integration. We gave up our communities, left ourselves wide open to gentrification, calling the cycle of self hatred, taught to equate black with second rate. Instead of sticking together, we rather try to assimilate. Instead of being proud, we rather be ashamed. Instead of giving back when we make it, we forget where we came from. Instead of giving back to the hood, we just take away. And the first chance we get, we take our money and find somewhere else to stay. This for Treme, what the musicians used to play before the city started shutting down the second line parades, before they redlined us off with the I-10 highway. This for the lower nine, where my people used to stay, where the levees always seemed to break. 1927, Hurricane Betsy, Katrina. This for all our people who couldn't afford to evacuate, stranded with no food and no shelter for days. This for all our people who pass away. This for all the people who got shot dead by the National Guard brigades. This for all the projects that got told down. Why are people supposed to go now? Ain't none of this accidental. Them devils got it all planned out. Downtown, uptown, it's the same story all around. In New Orleans and all across the nation, it's the same things we facing. Modern day enslavement, prison privatization, colonization, appropriation, exploitation, destabilization, displacement, disaster capitalization. This for every hood, every ghetto, every body on every slum. This for whole African diaspora never forget where we come from. You gotta do two, Jai. Oh, <laughs> all right. Um, I got another one. It's kind of about the storm and stuff. Um, I said, there was a storm coming, you could feel it in the air. We ain't know where to go, but we had to go somewhere. Couldn't stay back in the city one night and left for us down missing home. So bad, but they say it ain't safe to go back. And now they saying that we refugees. Mm. Mm. Yeah, now they saying that we refugees. The mayor ordered us out to evacuate. So we had to pack our bags and go out of state. Some of us couldn't leave, they had to stay behind. All we could do was pray they stay alive. No one came to our people's rescue. They had a child do so for themselves. Tell me what are they supposed to do but loot when they want no food left. The pigs supposed to serve and protect us. Instead, they focus in on theft, shooting people in the back. They weren't trying to arrest. Now the city in chaos because people lost everything they had. Some cows killed my uncle in a carjacking gone bad. It was too much for my granny to take. She passed away soon after that. My auntie left right behind her. Their funerals were back to back. Now I ain't had no time to mourn. She had to pick up the slack. They sent me out of state hoping I'd stay on the right track, but I ain't know how to act. I just cut in the depth, had pressure building up in me. I was always ready to snap. I seen how people phase the change when I told them where I was from. Our neighborhood was infamous. They labeled it a slum, labeled it a disaster zone. Ground zero still looked like a bomb went off, even though the storm hit so many years ago. They left the house abandoned, and tore the project buildings down, planned to raise the price to live and push all of us out. They trying to force us out the city, but I ain't about to go. I'll die before I leave the hood. It's the only home I know. I ain't about to be no refugee. Yeah. 
So, Jay, I want to embarrass you. Where you at now? <laughs> you said, well, man, I knew you were yeah. supposed to say, look, I'm, I'm out here trying to get my stuff right so I can get back to New Orleans. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> Out there in, 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 in San Diego. That's what everybody say. I'm coming back. I'm be back. <laughs> Jai Salam. Thank you much. Thank you. And sort of to kind of put the cap back on the empty bottom, we got the owner of this here establishment. Well, okay. <laughs> I knew Chuck before he was Chuck. <laughs> Chuck Perkin, come on up here. You, you got the... <laughs> you up, you up, you up, go ahead, you up. <clears throat> okay, I haven't done this poem in a while, so hopefully I can get through the whole thing. I've been in the back trying to rehearse. <laughs> I wrote this after um, reading that book, uh, Frenchman Desire Good Children. So. And that's what I tell you. Chapatula goes to the market every day. He's a fisherman. After running through Julia and three Greek muses, he comes to Felicity. Napoleon plows through the Roman Colosseum, gathering steam at a camp headed straight for Chapatulas. Chapatulas have already heard the muscle, muffled submissions to Napoleon's fury after passing through Milan and Constantinople. So he raced to warn the Chippewa that they shouldn't cross Napoleon. Chapatula runs up the other side of the river to warn the other Chippewa. Instead, he runs into Robert, Amelia, Eleanor, and Duvisat, living his version of the movie Groundhog Day. Where did all the white people come from? In New Orleans, religious run from nuns. And saints double cross each other like two-bit hustlers. St. Claude crossed St. Philip. St. Philip became so distraught, he ran straight for the bourbon. St. Claude used to run with good children. He's a Renaissance man. Every day in New Orleans, he's running to art, music, painters, desire, and piety. Every day in New Orleans, St. Claude runs from a flood to Poland and France and Spain. Martin Luther King runs into the Spanish governors, Galvez and Nero. They tried convincing him they're straight shooters, but every day they meet up with St. Bernard and end up being crooked. They all start out being smooth. Madison developed a complex because he was too short. <laughs> Shirley bemoaned the fact that she didn't have any curves. Jeanette's constantly running to Monticello. When is she gonna understand that the relationships are dead in the street? <laughs> the Frenchman is running to hope, law, benefits, agriculture, abundance, and yes, humanity. People always whispering about the Frenchman. Well, I can tell you, I saw him when he went into the quarter and I saw him when he came out. <laughs> that Frenchman was never straight. <laughs> this is for my melody makers, for my cowbell ringers and my tambourine shakers. It's for the lady buck jumpers, for the rebirth brass band and the storyville stumpers, for the soul rebels in the hot eight, for the little rascals wanting a dime when all they got is eight. It's for Kermit Ruffin and the barbecue swingers, for Marva Wright and all my blues singers for making that music that heal our pain. It's, it's, it's for Shannon Powell and Lil Liza Jane. I got Liza, you got Liza, we got Liza. I'm from the Noya and I thought I told you. It's for the Golden Comanches and the Wild Mac Noya. For loving our city, we ain't giving up an inch. It's for Stanton Moore, Bob and George French. We love her scat and we love her razzle dazzle. It's for Irvin Mayfield and Jermaine Basil. It's for Dr. Michael White for keeping it tight and for Uncle Lionel still raising hell. We sure gonna miss him when we die. 
It's for Troy Sawyer and Kevin O'Day, Kid Chocolate Brown and John Boutte, for Dave Torkanowski and Walter Wolfman, for Trombone Shorty and the whole Andrews clan, and the Marcellus clan and the Baptiste clan too. Sure may Neville, this poem's for you. And don't forget Kid Jordan and the whole Jordan crew. It's for Philip Manuel and Leah Chase. Hurling Raleigh on drums, rolling Garen on bass. Holla if you hear me. It's for Corey Henry on trombone, Kirk Joseph on sousaphone, Donald Harrison on sax. I take off my hat for Benny Jones and Leroy Jones and all our musicians who came back home. Kalamu, this poem's for you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, folks, we hope we hope we hope you have enjoyed these. Um, I started to say writers and poets and whatever, but they were liars and versifiers. There were <laughs> there were people that told the truth, but they didn't tell it straight. They tell it however they felt it, coming out the gate, right? Yeah. That's the way they. That's the way they did it, and. Um, I'm going to end with just a little piece of this uh, Beneath the Bridge, a 2006 eulogy for North Claiborne Avenue from Canal Street down to Elysian Fields. 2006 was the year after 2005, which was the year when the levees broke. And if you'd been here in 2006, you might have thought this city ain't going to never come back. I mean, Everything was crusty, dusty, and dirty. And at one point, they didn't even have no birds in the sky. One, no pigeons on Rampart and Canal. They had flown. In fact, I don't believe you could find a roach. It was rough. So, but back then, beneath the bridge on Claiborne Avenue, there, where the Mardi Gras Indians used to go and offer up their colorful vows to never bow down as they trotted around the mean streets of this sacred town, freely treating our eyeballs to the most prettiest feathered multi-hued suits that any man could ever hope to sew and wear in any given lifetime. They hollered the chants of saints, their eyes burning with the fire of the guardians of the flame, sounding out sacred syllables in a language without name, words whose meaning we could not specify, but whose dynamic intentions none of us could deny. That's enough right now. I thank y'all for coming out here. And uh, oh, Hollywood. Hollywood's in the house he called up at the last minute he had to he had to go pick up some poach out or something no dude, man i've been in here i've been watching you listening to you <laughs> all right okay so this is hollywood 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 be up there on on uh aretha castle hill it used to be dry street at our shea center here it is right here our shea cultural art center that's where he be this is hollywood go ahead man Oh, greetings, family. I, I don't know how y'all want me to go after this, brother. <laughs> but uh, greetings and salutations. Um, I'm just uh, so pleased and so moved uh, to be in the spirit with you all this evening. I mean, um, what can I say, man? Just to, you know, as I think Quest alluded to it, it's, it's a little different, you know, to be sitting at your house uh, and not in the room with y'all. But um, we're giving thanks to the technology guys that we can still be together. Um, so let me uh, let me first say you know um, that this this book is uh, is phenomenal. I mean, um, I've been in so many spaces with so many of these folks, but to actually be on pages with them is something that I can hand to somebody is really is really beautiful. And I give thanks to Bob Kalamu uh, for his stewardship, not only for this uh, this book, but also for our community. I think anybody who calls themselves a poet or even an artist in the city of New Orleans has both uh, Marcus Christian and Bob Kalamu Yasalam to thank, um, you know, for, for, for having that distinction. So uh, giving thanks to you, Bob, I appreciate you so much. Um, this piece that's in the book is called uh, 
the soul of New Orleans or the soul of Inua, one of them, when I, I started writing these pieces, I was walking through the Katrina waters or the levee waters, we should say. Um, it started formulating them. So I'll give that one to y'all and I'll give y'all a quick one to get out. Uh, thank you again. So um, you are the soil where souls find the strength to stand. Your garden hardened with thoughts of magnolias and bourbon. Your seeds sprouting across the globe and even when your bowl overflowed, the gumbo wasn't too spicy to keep us wanting more. So we feast on your false beliefs. Shout up at southern skies to shower us with voodoo and moonshine or the strip the little boys on street corners with Sammy Davis stems pounding pavement while tourists find shit funny and children run after purposely unaimed nickels dancing down sidewalk. We love you with an ignorant curiosity. Brushing your lips with only the hint of a kiss. Commitmentless carnivores whoring out your soul for doubloons and beads and kickbacks. It's dreams we lack. So we drown in tears and floodwaters. Swimming through deception and lies, show the high compromise and bring New Orleans back commissions. But this be Southern living. Them closing schools and building prisons. Confusing our new religion, got the billboards to prove it. Lost heart and heavy movement, but soul, you are worth fighting for. So I give you my words. But you have inspired me to aspire to be just a part of your history. Your memories paved with spirits of greatness that even the great flood couldn't erase. I am part of you, soul, left to die by those on high. For somewhere between the water line and the color line lies the poverty line. So we stood in line for shelter, safe haven, and overdue reparations. For patience where it's thin when all hope is done. And I know all white boy presidents not crazy, but I can think of at least one. Through politics, they stay connected. The people unprotected. The wetland still neglected as you get dissected to the highest bidder. Oh, how I long to hold you so. But arms grow weak like levees. Hearts lay heavy with thoughts of tomorrow for the city that care for God. A governmental plot blamed on Mother Nature's fury. Vision blurry from media blast of downbeat broadcast from a circumstance they can never understand. No name reporters getting famous off our faults, famous off our loss. Put New Orleans on a cross and crucify. They quick to catch the close up, watch your children die. Evacuee slash poet, refugee slash musician, constituent slash looter, survivor slash sinner, American citizen slash great grandson of a former slave dancing on Congo squares and raised graves in Treme to African drums and brass bands. I'm speaking in tongues with Mardi Gras Indian chants. I'm fading from rooftops and super domes. I'm screaming for help, just craving for home. To me, you are more than just a Mardi Gras mambo, more than black and catfish and gumbo. You are that jazz song I heard that I realized music could move me. You are the muse of Cajun moons mixed with the heat of sexy Southern humidity. You are the birthplace of civil rights. You're the reason why I write. You're the night I made all my wrongs and the morning I tried to make them right. You're the spirit of seven ward hardheads buried in the 17th street canals. You're the song of a hundred thousand strong from uptown to the east. We still begging to come home so that I won't leave you so. I won't throw it to the wolves and watch them tear you to pieces. I can't give you back to those who couldn't keep you. I will gather your children from across this land, for you are the soul where souls find the strength to stand. New Orleans, you are not just where I live. You are who I am. And I don't know so much, but I know I love you. And that may be all I need to know. Yeah. Yeah. And one reason, y'all, to, to check out a lot of the poets in this little book here, we got 36 poets, 36 of them. And um, we can't fit them all in the room tonight, but you're going to hear from almost all of them in time. Uh, Bill Lavender, thank you much. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah. And you want to say something, maybe? I'm going to tell you thank you. 
<laughs> All right. I'm, I'm glad it. when your head knocks, you listen and that you made this book. I am New Orleans from UNO Press. Go ahead and find it. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you to all the poets that read for us. Thank you, Kalama, for hosting and editing. And I don't know, how many New Orleans poets have you raised? Uh, none. <laughs> <laughs> they escaped. They, they were listening. It's like, it's just like Chuck over there. They were listening. <laughs> they're all right. They're all right. We like them. We like them. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I want to thank also Jonathan Pitton, who's been on our board, uh, doing all our filming for us. Thank you to Chuck Perkins for letting us come into your space and do this live in this strange new world we're in. I hope next year we're back to normal a little bit more. Uh, thank you to our, our small audience here, participants, and our online Zoom audience as well. We are having events all month long, so you can go to nolapoetry.com and have we have on our main page that portal through Zoom or Facebook where you can easily access all these events. Tomorrow we have our first roundtable discussion. It's Poetics of Climate Change. It'll be at noon. All of our events are Central Standard Time here in New Orleans. Daylight, um, daylight time. I've it's never understood daylight. time and why it's different I everywhere. Thought, it's very I strange. I thought uh, uh, that CST stood for Chicago Standard Time. It's so confusing <laughs> to me. It's so confusing to me. Um, on Saturday, we will have our open mic. I'll be hosting that. That'll be noon to four. We have uh, about 30 something poets from Hungary, Italy, all over the US that'll be there. So please check that out as well. And then go to our calendar. As Bill said earlier, we have events every day in April. They are free. Come and join us. The chat was very lively tonight. Thank y'all for talking and supporting our artists as they read their poems. New Orleans, tell the world the poets are coming.